we continue with the introduction to the word. You are the living God who sustains all life in continually unfolding ways. And now, may we open our ears to your continually unfolding word. You speak to us in new and vital and imperative ways. With all the power you have given us, let us be silent and open to listening for nourishment, comfort, for challenge, and new focus. Amen. Today's reading is from the sixth chapter of Romans, beginning with the first verse. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died in sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A friend of mine lives in New York City, and she is always telling me that when I come to visit her, she always asks when that's going to be, that her and I have got to go down to the corner of 56th Street and Lexington Avenue in New York City. We've got to stop and see the baptismal font at St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Uh, she tells me that as you go into the front doors, uh, the baptismal font is right there to the left. And symbolically, that's a great place for the baptismal font because that's where our Christian journey uh, begins. And so uh, people who are baptized there at St. Peter's Lutheran Church have two options. Uh, they can uh, get baptized in the font, which, let me tell you about that font, um, it's probably unlike anything you've seen in uh, other uh, Lutheran churches. It's, uh, it's a deep pool, uh, it's elevated about uh, chest high, and a casual observer uh, might confuse it for a hot tub. I mean, three or four people can fit in there, but when you go and look down in there, you'll see that there are no jets. So it literally is their baptismal font. And uh, so when you ask one of the clergy people uh, at St. Peter's Lutheran Church, uh, how do baptisms get done here at St. Peter's? They will say, well, just like anywhere else. And then you might say, well, well, do people get dunked in the Lutheran Church? And they'll probably say something to the effect of, well, some do. Uh, some will go down into uh, the, the, the water and others will stand to the side and there they will get sprinkled from that pool. The most important thing, they say, is however we do the baptism, sprinkling or dunking, we have enough water to kill. Have enough water to kill the people? Hmm. Now, I have been accused, I have been accused of loving to use a lot of water. In fact, when I first uh, was, after I was ordained, uh, and I was at the first parish that I served, uh, sometimes I would watch the parents' looks because I took so much water that you'd think I was going to drown their kid. But that's what's happening at the font. We're being drowned. Theologically speaking, we're being drowned. Now, Paul would say, we die when we are baptized. Now, whether you remember your baptism or not, it's one of the keys to the meaning of being a Christian. 
Either way, whether you are dumped or sprinkled, Paul says the old life dies. Luther would say the old Adam, the old humanity is drowned at the font. And each and every day when we remember our baptisms, we are washed clean, the old is killed so that the new can have life. There's something deep going on at that font. Our sins are killed off. Our sins literally are washed away from the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gary Wills has a book on leadership, and in that he references Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, that remarkable slave woman who led African-American slaves to freedom by way of the Underground Railroad. And there is a remarkable detail about her life in his book. It seems that when Harriet Tubman was a teenager, she tried to stop the beating of a fellow worker. And her owner, and I just, just hate saying that, but her owner hit her on the head and cracked her skull. And Harriet lingered near death for weeks. For the rest of her life, she suffered from occasional catatonic spells due to that injury. But the injury also set her free. Wills notes, the blow that cracked Tubman's skull struck off her psychic chains. She had already died once, and she had nothing to lose. And she lived a life without that fear of death. You ever notice that Perhaps there are people that have been in your lives or are in your lives when they experience something, perhaps an illness or something that uh, literally has left them as good as dead. Physical, emotional, scars, pain. And all of a sudden, they emerge from that with a fresh and new perspective. They're not bound and held captive as they once were. And Paul says that that experience of being freed is at the heart of the Christian life. Uh, Paul says that the love of God surrounds us and that we are freed by our baptisms to live a life. And in a sense, uh, for the sins that we commit, God forgives us. Now that doesn't mean, Paul says, that we can go out and keep sinning and sinning and sinning because God forgives us. Paul says that no, we are to live freed of the power of death, washed in the newness of God, living that life. Now, some of us, I don't know, could be you, I know sometimes it's me, I sometimes coast along, trying not to make too many adjustments, right? We don't want to interrupt our schedules. We don't want to interrupt our pocketbooks. You know what? We don't want somebody telling us, holding us accountable. And when we are called on it, we make these little minor adjustments. But when one listens to the scripture, when one's old self is drowned, we're called to live a whole bold new life without fear. Now, some of you uh, might have had a class, uh, perhaps somewhere in your educational experience. Uh, and remember, we're always learning. We're always on an educational experience. Uh, and you might have read the, some of the poems of T.S. Eliot. Uh, and I'm drawing this one today from a book called The Collected Poems, 1909 to 1962. And perhaps this was one of the poems that you studied or you are familiar with. It's called The Journey of the Magi. Now, if you don't remember this poem from one of your classes, shame on you, but that's okay, I'm going to read it to you. And so here I read, I collected from poems 1909 to 1962, T.S. Eliot, The Journey of the Magi. So we have here in this account, in this poem, uh, uh, the voices of the Magi. T.S. Eliot writes, A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The way's deep and the weather's sharp, the very dead of winter. 
and the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing shirt. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn, we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a watermill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky, and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet, kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued, and arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place, as it was, you might say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, Set down. This set down. This. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our palaces, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation. With an alien people clutching their gods, I should be glad of another death. I should be glad of another death. We have these voices of the wise men reflecting on the newborn Christ child. One of the questions that they asked, you heard me read it, was, were we led all that way for birth or death? And then they say, certainly we saw the birth. But this birth, they say, was hard, filled with agony, like death. And then they say they return back to their kingdoms, right? They return back to this dispensation, the world in which they live in, with people grasping and clutching their false gods. I added the word false. T.S. Eliot did not put it there. And then we hear them saying, I will be glad for another death. A death from this old kingdom. A death from this old dispensation this world. A curious line. In Jesus Christ, as we look, as he goes from his birth to his life, to his death, to his resurrection, we're reminded in scripture that literally at the font, we too experience the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We're given a new life a new lease on life. And we don't have to be held down by the dispensation we now live in. We are freed and empowered because we no longer have to fear death, because death isn't the end, but the birth of a new life. We don't have to be fearful. We can live bold lives. And that's what's needed. There is so much pain around us. And our response needs to be the gospel, the love of God, where we seek justice, where we heal the pain of the world. As we go back into our worlds, this dispensation, so many different levels of sheltering in place are happening, so many different uh, uh, lines of communication about what is acceptable and not. 
there's still fear and anxiety in our world. We go boldly with the love of Jesus Christ. So let us go and boldly live because we've died at the font and we live now in the power of Jesus Christ's love. Amen.